This is Barkhadat, you're with the Mojo story, and it is an extremely interesting day to talk about Narendra Modi, hours after that dramatic repeal of the farm laws. We'll be decoding the prime minister and how the country is changing or not changing under him, even as a new book by political scientist Christoph Jafferlaw looks at what he calls Modi's India, the book which has only recently been published and has been the subject of much debate, actually looks at what it calls the rise of Hindu nationalism and ethnic democracy. What does Christoph exactly mean by classifying India as an ethnic democracy? That is only one of the many questions that I've been itching uh, to ask him, and there was never a better context than now, as I said, coming just as the Prime Minister has moved away from a script that at least his supporters and possibly even his critics never thought he would veer away from. Christoph, uh, it's great to reconnect after all these years. I want to take you back first to the very title of your book. There is a Modi's India. And by that very title in the book, there implies that this is an India different from, let's say, Vajpayee's India, or Manmohan Singh's India, or Indira Gandhi's India. What is that difference in one in one sentence, if you had to frame it? Well, never before, probably, we've seen power concentrated in so few hands. And uh, of course, uh, Indira did concentrate, it, did concentrate power in her hands, um, but not for such a long time, and not to that extent because when, when I say that uh, the number of ends at work are very few, I mean politically, but I also mean economically. Mm. And the kind of chronic capitalism India is experiencing these days, the rise of Gautama Dhani, for instance, is something truly unprecedented in the history of India. So this is one of the reasons why it's a different India. There are many other reasons, and I'm sure we'll have many occasions to return to that. Yeah, but you know, when you talk about power not being concentrated or centralized, uh, you know, we have this split image on the screen that we're seeing uh, of Indira and, and Narendra Modi. These are parallels that you have drawn yourselves uh, in your writings. But even the concentration of uh, business power or the crony capitalism or uh, the close relationships between industrial houses and, and, and the government. I mean, Dhirubhai Ambani and Indira, you know, the Indira Gandhi years were not that different. Why is this different? So we can go one step further and say another big difference is, and that's the title, the subtitle of, of the book, the making of an ethnic democracy. And an ethnic democracy is something you can define by drawing a parallel with Israel, which is the prototype of an ethnic democracy. A country where you have elections, a relatively independent judiciary, still some few media were free, mm -hmm. but some citizens, many citizens, were not as equal as others. And you have this uh, notion of second class citizens made of the minorities. The, in Israel, um, the second class citizens are de jure. It's in the constitution. Israel is a Jewish state. In India, it's de facto. And de facto, Muslims don't have access to the jobs, the flats, the um, occupations uh, that that uh, others um, may enjoy. And this is something you did not see under Indira. And by the way, I would not consider that Dhirubhai benefited as much as Gautam Adani from from the rulers. There okay, let's unpack there. this. Let's unpack this bit by bit and one by one. Yeah. Uh, you have, you have, I know, in your book, drawn a parallel between Israel and India, and that is why you use the nomenclature ethnic democracy, uh, where you are basically talking about, uh, you know, I, as it were, uh, a cultural majority also becoming a political majority, and thereby the minorities being left behind. But the process of elections, the robustness of elections, doesn't actually halt. And that is interesting because, uh, you know, Modi does lose elections. He does lose state elections, which does point to the fact that at least electorally, India continues to be a robust democracy. What do you mean by ethnic democracy and how is it different from majoritarianism, which is another phrase that we hear all the time? 
you can use the same phrase. Majoritarianism and ethnic democracy are absolute synonyms. They reflect the same bias um, affecting minorities in their uh, access to, to citizenship. In, in the case of India, of course, it's not only de facto, it's mostly de facto, but it's also somewhat de jure. When you have laws at the state level in BGP rule states, which make inter-religious marriages very difficult, if not impossible. Mm -hmm. When you have laws in some other states, including Gujarat, where to sell your house to someone of a different religion is almost impossible also. And when you have the Citizenship Amendment Act, which considers that only non-Muslim refugees from Bangladesh, Afghanistan, and Pakistan are eligible to citizenship in India, you are shifting towards a de jure form of ethnic democracy and majoritarianism. Okay, so let's talk about two things that have recently happened where people's movements have actually forced the Modi government to e either pause or reverse a decision. You spoke about the citizenship uh, legislation, though that legislation actually went through what was supposed to follow, which was the, the, the NRC, which was creating this register of citizenships, was actually de facto paused because of the massive people's movement, student-led movements. Now, I turn your attention to the repeal of the farm laws, right? Uh, now, this is something I think nobody thought would happen. Many explanations have been given for it, elections, it's actually not clear that this was a huge election in Uttar Pradesh outside of Western UP. The BJP is not even a factor in Punjab. So I'm not completely convinced about the electoral reason, but that's one theory. The other theory is a concern about internal security, given the fissures that were possibly taking seed around Sikh identity in the sensitive border state of Punjab. But either way, Narendra Modi has managed to confound his critics and his supporters alike. When you see Prime Minister Modi dramatically, um, you know, coming on, 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 on national TV and then declaring these farm laws basically dead, how do you see the Modi and, the, and Modi's India in that context? Well, first of all, it's not because India is different that the past is completely written off and people are defending their rights, are defending what they had acquired as peasants, as minority members, whatever. But the resistance is not over for sure. So uh, these movements, uh, more than political opposition, by the way, show that uh, a point of no return is not reached and nothing irreversible has happened so far. Now, how do we interpret the, the last decision by Narendra Modi uh, regarding the farms laws? Elections are definitely a factor. And I think Narendra Modi is primarily a political animal, I would say election oriented, like many populists. And we may return to that because uh, India, Modi's India is probably well defined, not only by ethnic democracy, but, but also by what I call national populism and electoral authoritarianism. Uh, elections are on both sides, very important. This is in elections that you get the legitimacy you need for prevailing over other institutions. So the fact that he can dilute, postpone, shows that he is certainly very well conscious of what needs to be done to remain in office and to remain popular. So it, it qualifies its ideological inclinations is mm. definitely a pure product of RSS. He is definitely in Dodva um, in, in is he, is he, but, I would I, I would I would I would hold you there and argue that my observation as a journalist of the Prime Minister is that he is not driven uh, by ideology alone. Uh, and maybe not even primarily. Uh, in fact, I would say he is driven very much by the element of surprise. It's almost as if there is nothing that he enjoys more than surprise, whether it is going to Pakistan to meet Nawaz Sharif when it was least expected, whether it was announcing demonetization, whether it is to reverse the farm laws. There is almost nothing that the prime minister does that can be exactly predicted. This and is Yes. And, 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 and does that make him ideological? Does that make him really a product of Hindutva in a way that we can understand in 
that boundary? That this is why I call him national populist. He is a nationalist. He is a Hindu nationalist. But like many others, including Erdogan, Bolsonaro, Trump, Duterte, the list is very long. A national populist in the parameters of his nationalism tries to retain charisma. And charisma is very much nurtured by the surprise you were mentioning. You know, what is charisma? The charismatic leader is the one who is exceptional, not good or bad. It can be virtuous or not virtuous. Mahatma Gandhi had a different charisma, most based on virtues, but you can have a black hero, a Kalanayak of some kind, that can be equally charismatic. And Indira, and, and Indira Gandhi was charismatic for the same reason. She did things exceptional. You know, the, 20, the 1974 uh, nuclear test, uh, war against uh, Pakistan, Sikkim annexation, and, and, and Modi is emulating this. Uh, it's Balakot, it's demilitarization, it's, uh, of course, the pogrom of 2002. So many things, exceptional, unprecedented, good or bad. It mm -hmm. depends how you look at it. But what you cannot deny is that he has done things nobody before had tried to do. And Article 370 uh, is also on that list. Uh, nobody had tried to do it before either. So this element of surprise is a component of populism. The populist retains this, you can say, channel of communication with the people by surprising the people all the time. Also in terms of techniques of communication, holograms in Gujarat and so many others, um, so many other uh, techniques. But, 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 in, but in every instance, and because technology has enabled uh, that kind of uh, that kind of communication and therefore altered the, how politics and power is actually dispersed, in every instance, uh, Modi actually confuses his own supporters. Uh, because, for example, these supporters who had called these protesting farmers Khalistanis, anti-nationals, extremists. And right now I'm not going into some of the misses of the farmers movement. There were some definitely. Uh, but I'm just saying that the, that the support base of Modi was primed up to attack the protesting farmers. Then Mr. Modi appears with his hands folded, apologizes to the nation, calls these people his brothers. Where does that leave the national populist supporters? Because national populists do not have supporters who are the same forever. They don't try to relate to a specific constituency. They aim at the people at large, at the nation at large. And most of them don't have parties. The parties need them more than they need the parties. You know, they short circuit their political machine. And Mandra Modi emancipated himself from the Sangh Parivar and BGP many decades ago, as early as 2007 in the Gujarat elections. He had his own parallel power structure, techniques of communication. Is the man in relation to the people at large. So the supporters may change, may vary in the course of time, and uh, he does not really care. And when he talks to his brothers and sisters, he systematically refers to 1.3 million Indians. So his supporters are supposed yeah. to be the nation. He is the nation. He is the people. Yeah. So here's 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 my question. I want to go back to the parallel you draw between the Prime Minister and Indira Gandhi. And one of the very interesting things you wrote was to say that the disassociation in the mind of the person or the, the, the voter between her suffering and the leader. That is what happened uh, with Indira and that is what's happening with Narendra Modi. And I personally found this as I traveled around India reporting COVID, I found people were not angry with Modi. They were just not angry with Modi. And you write how something very similar happened uh, with Indira. So talk a little bit about that very effective disassociation between ordinary the suffering, the common person's tragedies, and what she expects from her leader. Yeah. Well, the charismatic leader is above accountability. He cannot be responsible for your suffering. And that was true, indeed, under Indira. Indira was re-elected in 1980. 
with Sanjay as a right hand man. They were the two main culprit of the emergency and so much suffering indeed. But they got away with it. And the people might have accused the bureaucracy, the second range of leadership, but not them. They were above uh, accountability. Same with, with Narendra Modi. And, and also in, in both cases, a capacity to relate to the people, to speak to the people as if they were the people. And never forget that Indira started to do that on the radio. And that is exactly the medium Narendra Modi is using for Man Ki Baat. And I really urge you to listen to Man Ki Baat. I'm sure you do, because this is the best way to understand how, how does Modi um, escape accountability uh, because of this communication. And the last point is, in both cases, Indira and, and Narendra Modi, you have this uh, sense of victimization. They are victims. They are victims of all kinds of people. Indira was the victim of the syndicate, was the victim of the bosses of the party, was the victim also of those who wanted to kill her. Mm -hmm. And she repeatedly said, they want to kill me. And that was on public platforms. Similarly, Narendra Modi can say, I've been a victim. I was a Chaivala and I come from the plebeians. Plus, they want to kill me. And you may remember the series of fake encounters in Gujarat 2003, 2006, when Lashkarit Taiba people were supposedly after him. And the fact that he is defending the people against others who want to get rid of him are, are another very interesting parallel. Well, I should say on those encounters, the, the judiciary eventually took a different view. And, and, and therefore, even the framing of those encounters as being extra constitutional, uh, uh, you know, it would not work today in strictly in the eyes uh, of the law, Christoph. And therefore, here's, here's my question to you. Uh, the elections and the electoral process in India clearly do work. That Modi can betray anxiety about elections is also evident. It's not that he's above anxiety, because otherwise perhaps the repeal of the farm laws uh, uh, would not have happened. But there is something about both of these leaders that is enabled by the failure of those who oppose them. And so if this is how you understand Modi's communication, how do you understand the communication of the opposition? How did we get to a place where majoritarianism uh, was so acceptable, where pluralism or the idea at least of political secularism was so corroded? Yeah, the, the, this question of the opposition again is um, something you can compare to other uh, situations. It took 15 years to the opponents of Netanyahu to put their house in order and have one candidate against Bibi. It took 20 years for the opponents of Erdogan to gradually do the same thing. To oppose someone who is supposed to embody the nation is very difficult. And to join hands against this person is always very difficult. Um, if, if Indira had not put the Congress or the BKD, the socialist and the Jansongis together in jail in 75, they would have probably not been able to, 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 to promote also a united front against her. And, and she made this mistake. Now, it's very difficult to, to oppose someone who embodies the nation because he is the nation, but it's also very difficult for another reason. I mean, it reminds me, frankly, of the India is Indira, Indira is India uh, description. Exactly, exactly. But another reason for the opposition to be in such a weak situation is one, the capacity to co-opt, to purchase, literally speaking, MLAs and MPs all the time. And therefore, you may lose election, but you keep the, the you retain the government in Karnataka, in Madhya Pradesh and many other places. Two, we are in a situation that I describe as electoral authoritarianism. It's not as if we had a level playing field, not at all. The election commission is not what it used to be. And the fate of uh, Ashok Lavasa bears testimony of this. The, uh, Yet I nobody read... really believes that the elections per se do not reflect how people want to vote. Otherwise, Bengal would that. not have happened. Otherwise, Bengal, yeah. No, no. 
I'm not I'm not saying that. I'm saying the level playing field is not what it used to be. Mm. Because of the erosion of the independence of the election commission, because of the kind of election election bonds the BGP can benefit from, BGP could spend 3.6 billion dollars in 2019, more than all the opposition parties. And last but not least, the media coverage is certainly not equitable. And therefore, you have elections, you have the democratic side of a democracy, you have the popular facade of a democracy, you don't have the rule of law that was there before and that made the level playing field absolutely impeccable, at least in the last uh, 20 years. But, and that's corollary, the state elections and the national elections are completely different today. And the decoupling of both shows that Modi cannot be beaten easily. BJP is not popular in many states. And that's why to lose Uttar Pradesh might have been a very strong motivation for withdrawing the farmers' laws. Uh, Uttar Pradesh is so important for the Rajya Sabha for so many reasons. Yeah. Uh, let, let, let me ask you this. There's another very interesting idea that comes from your writings on the idea of Modi uh, as Fakir. And Modi himself has self-referenced himself using exactly that word. And especially in the build up to the Bengal elections, some thought that the, sort of the beard was like Tagore. Uh, but there is this sort of, you know, if you look at some of the images of Narendra Modi, there is this sort of I am leaving it all behind. I don't have attachments. I don't have children. Uh, and, you know, I have met voters in, in, the, in the heartland of North India, at least, who have said to me that they do not believe, uh, uh, you know, that corruption is something that Modi would need to indulge in because he has nobody to leave it to. Even his mother, his aging mother lives alone. So the idea of the prime minister is a sort of fakir. The only other public figure who embraced this image was Gandhi. So talk a little bit about this. Now, this is fascinating. The, one of the first time he uses this word was in uh, Muradabad in a fascinating election campaign meeting after demonetization. When the economy was on its knees, the poor were the most badly affected. And he said, it is for you. This demonetization is for you and it's against the rich and I am a fakir I am like you and people were clapping mm -hmm. now we, we have just finished a, a, a very interesting study of the man kibat um, speeches so to speak uh, with one of my uh, uh, colleagues Jean Thomas Martelly to to look at the words which were used the the, the tone that was used and we compared this to the speeches on TV of yogis, Baba Ramdev, others, there are so many. And we compare the same style to the kind of speeches Manmohan Singh, Indira Gandhi, Nehru, Ambedkar, we are doing. The style of Narendra Modi in terms of discourse analysis, and we have, we have processed millions of words, is the style of a yogi. He speaks to the people as a conscience keeper, as a mentor, as, a, as someone who will tell you how to be happy in life, and how to be good. Well, this is certainly- So it's what, like your moral science class in school. Exactly, he is, he is a guru, like a, a, a guru ji, <laughs> if you want. Yeah. But, a prach, but the Pracharak at the same time, it's exactly what the Pracharak does on the Shaka. There is no big difference in that sense with yeah. uh, the style he had uh, when he was uh, Pran Pracharak in Gujarat. And to that extent, you know, unlike Western cultures, uh, where, for example, you've, you know, in the United States of America, you could not even imagine having a, a single person, man or woman, run for president. You would need to see the partner and the children and the dog and the picket fence. Uh, in India, though there is such a strong sense of family at the heart of community, Modi's uh, sort of you know, being without the trappings of a family, uh, the family portrait not uh, not fitting him actually tends to give him a kind of self, you know, self claimed political transcendence almost, as yeah. if he's above everybody else because he has none of these trappings. That's why you need you need to look at national populism 
in its cultural context. The kind of tools Erdogan is using in an Islamic society and the kind of tool and, and, and references um, Modi is, is using are bound to be different. And in India, you have this uh, Guru Shishya Parampara that is so strong, which means that you need advice, you need a mentor, you need someone to tell you. And sometimes you follow blindly and critically the words of the sage, the man who knows. Uh, similarly, you have the prestige of sacrifice, of renunciation. You know, this is, of course, the Sanyazin uh, model uh, that has so deep cultural, um, uh, I would say, uh, echoes. So, yes, uh, this is a repertoire that has mm. been used before. And uh, Mahatma Gandhi certainly uh, resorted to this saintly politics. Uh, but uh, he has updated that. By the way, Narendra Modi said once, there is only one brand in India that is the Gandhi brand. He's probably now emulating this brand, this capacity to create his own sub-brand, so to speak, in the saintly politics repertoire. And that's why he has grown a beard and that will be probably his last incarnation. How interesting. But, you know, uh, there is communication and the persona uh, at the heart of, uh, you know, what Modi is. But there's also the perception that he's tough, uh, that he says sorry when he needs to, that he uh, takes risks. I, I hear a lot of people talking about the capacity for risk. And uh, there is also something to be said about microeconomics. You know, so for example, uh, whether or not India is reeling uh, economically from COVID, you will still meet very poor people talking about, I got 500 rupees in my bank account, or I got a gas cylinder. So can you divorce policy entirely from persona in understanding Modi and Modi's India? You've made two points there. One is indeed Modi's image is also the strong man image. You know, it's not only the sage, uh, the fakir, far from that. And, and that's <laughs> the power of charisma to have different uh, facets. He has many, many, many facets. But the two main ones are this one, uh, are, are the fakir and the strong man uh, patrolling uh, in, uh, with the army on the border and, uh, and ordering Balakot. And oh, definitely, this is definitely very important. And, and and the um, other thing is, yes, he has done some something for the poor. But you know, it's very interesting when you look at what he has done. Manmohan Singh with the NRAGA had given money to the poor. Mm. There was, you know, sometimes you've had, some years, you've had 0.7% of the GDP devoted to NRG, massive, massive plan that has really helped people to get out of poverty in millions. Now, anybody has not given money to the people. He has given latrines, Swaj Bharat. He has given gas cylinders, Ujwal Yojana. And he has given bank account and a plastic card, the Jandan Yojana. He has not given money. He has given the bank account. It may repent Kali, it may repent empty, but these three things are a reflection of what I call a politics of dignity. You know, he has considered them for yeah. an open defecation for India, for saving the women who were using cow dung for, prepare, for cooking. Uh, and of course, women are one of the main targets. And that's yeah. true of the Jandan Yojana as well. So you have this, this very specific new brand of welfareism. It's not the welfare policies we were used to. It's much cheaper. It doesn't cost as much. It does not bring people out of poverty. There are, there are more poor people now in India than 10 years ago. But it works, as you said. People expect something, get something, and 
this is what Nilanjan Kishakar calls Vishwas politics. You know, they think that it may not be my turn, but he's there, he'll deliver. It is it come it, to me. Yeah, it's exactly the same way that demonetization was actually positioned. It was class and you know, it was suggesting that 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 the rich and the poor are finally standing in the same line, and it was you know playing to class wars. I have to I have to end, but I have to end on a note of uh, something that gave me a lot of uh, hope, which was the story of the gurdwaras uh, that opened their doors. Uh, for Muslims in the neighborhood to offer namaz after a particularly ugly uh, dispute uh, uh, over whether public spaces could be used uh, by these Muslim neighborhoods to, to, to offer namaz. I bring this up uh, to, to, to make the point to you that do you believe that in this, in this country of, 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 of mine and one that you have loved and followed for so many years, there are deep-seated uh, self-correcting mechanisms that do tend to assert themselves from time to time that bring the balance back or do you believe that institutionally there is a danger of losing this or oh, the danger is there definitely and uh, i followed another country for many years pakistan and in pakistan i've seen the point of no return being reached after a few decades but without but, but, but without election i mean they they they're a very different uh, no, structurally uh, totally different well not totally different <laughs> structurally <laughs> i mean in the way that power is organized yes uh, yes it, it is structurally yeah, but, completely but is different the and the idea of its origin is totally different but this is the point if there is a deep state in the making in india and uh, that is something to to watch very very closely now and i share your hope and 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 your optimism uh, the point of no return, I repeat, has not been reached, and society is inheriting a legacy of so many centuries of the same civilization, the Hindustani civilization, the Indo-Islamic civilization. And the Sikh people are probably today the most exemplifying, I mean, those who exemplify uh, this this. Uh, capacity of relating to others in a compassionate manner. And this is something that may come back also because there is a class element in this. And why should the poor get divided uh, along religious lines when, when the real issue is, is uh, possibly uh, uh, along class lines? By the way, this is the main hypothesis of the book. Modidva is a response to Mandal, and the Song River desperately needed someone to bring the plus vote that would be the antidote to Mandal with uh, any well, uh, today the BJP. Well, today the BJP of today, and you know this, calls itself the Mandal plus Kamandal party. Exactly. And uh, Modi brought that because of his uh, OBC background, because of uh, his... Uh, real um, commitment to grassroots work. And um, working at the grassroots level is something the left is not doing for decades and something the Sankh Parivar is doing for a century now, 100 yeah. years almost. Yeah. So yes, that's why um, it uh, has, he has been supported by the Sankh Parivar in spite of not being the cup of tea of RSS in the beginning. Uh, now the real question is after Modi, who? How, after Modi, how can the BGP and the Song River sustain this? And uh, I think uh, the party will have, like the Congress after Indira, a very yeah. tough time because how do you rebuild a party that has been hollowed from the inside? A party who, where the chief ministers are parachuted from the center without any local base. You know, nobody knew who the new chief minister of Gujarat was the day before he was appointed. And, and, and some would say that that actually completes the Congressification 
uh, of the BJP to that degree, that high command culture. Uh, Christoph, uh, this has been fascinating. Uh, I, 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 you know, for everything you say, I think of a, 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 another thought. For example, I thought of Yogi Adityanath as the one chief minister that even Narendra Modi finds difficult to dislodge. Uh, but we, we'll bring you back. Uh, we have to leave it there. It's um, Christoph Jaffrelor's uh, new book, uh, Modi's uh, India, Hindu Nationalism and uh, the Rise of uh, Ethnic Democracy is out. Do read it, even if you want to disagree with it. Please first read it and then disagree with it. Thank you, Christoph. Pleasure having you on and see you soon again. Thanks for the Thank time. You, Thank, Thank you, Baka. Thank you and bye-bye. 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 It's great to see you here. Thank you for watching our work. If you haven't subscribed yet, don't forget to click the bell icon and subscribe to Mojo Story and support independent, robust journalists.